show up in the cities. What's the overall theme? Show up in the cities. And that's why I love this song. It said, shine bright in the city. Lord, you said go. Spread your word around. So we will go to every village, every town. And we won't fear. We will never be ashamed. We'll be examples of your love. Share the word in Jesus' name. And we'll shine bright in the city. Share your light like we never have before. We'll shine bright in the city. Share your light like we never have, never have before. Lord, you said go. Share your word around. So we will go to every village, every town. And we won't fear, we will never be ashamed. We'll be examples of your love. Spread your world in Jesus' name. One, two, three. We'll shine bright in the city. Share your light like we never have before. We'll shine bright in the city. Share your light like we never have, never have before. We will share your light. We will share your light. Say it again, say we will share. city share your light like we never have before we'll shine bright in the city share your light like we never have never have before and today the topic is does god love your city what is the name of the topic today what is and during the week well you wouldn't be meeting every evening but i'll give you the evening topic tomorrow it would be transforming cities day two day three it would be facing loneliness in your city in case you want to tune in online if you are not meeting here because remember this is a global initiative so i'm sure if you go to youtube and enter any of these you might see uh, a church in jamaica or a church in st lucia or a church in america or a church in uk you would see any church having any of these themes if they have if they are celebrating global youth day and the global youth week of prayer as well day four would be facing depression in your city day five would be facing illness in your city day six would be facing hopelessness in your city day seven would be facing fear in your city and day eight would be lifting the fallen in your city so the emphasis for this week is show up in the cities and today we will be doing does god love your city bow with me as we pray father in heaven we are part of a global emphasis we are so small here but each person has a part to play in winning a soul why because each soul is precious in your sight regardless of where we exist or where we live so today may we make an impact in our little city may we leave here purposing to do so because we are children of you and we have to share the light in jesus name so when i saw does god love your city and the global i say the only city we well our major city in trinidad is right but in your geographic domain your city is arima 
So you have Arima, Sando, different places, and we have Port of Spain. So when I saw God love, you, does God love your city? I thought anybody remember Aesop Fable, the country mouse and the tongue mouse. All right, these young people don't know. The, now, some of the, some of the Adventists watching me are like, Fable, a fable is a lie. You come on the pulpit to tell lie? Okay. I'm a literature background. So a fable is a literary device that is used to give a bigger truth. So from a literary perspective, because remember the fable that the king had given when he talked about the trees? Oh, you all don't remember that. Anybody remember that fable? No, you don't remember that fable? Take your Bibles and turn to Judges chapter 9, 7 to 20. And you would see when Jotham went and stood on Mount Gerizim. And he lifted his voice and he said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. A tree could anoint a king? A tree could talk? And they said to the olive tree, rain over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I cease giving my oil? A, 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 a olive tree could talk? No. With which they honor God and men and go sway over other trees. Then the tree said to the fig tree, you come and rain over us. But the fig tree said to them, should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the vine, you come and rain over us. But the vine said to them, should I cease my new wine, which cheers both God and men, and go sway over trees? Then all the trees said to the bramble, you come and rain over us. And the bramble said to the trees, if in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. And then, of course, he turned to them, shut and turned to them and told them, if you have acted in truth and sincerity in making him king. And he went on, because it was the whole issue of the kingship and so on. It was to teach a message. So go and read that whole chapter, Judges 9, 7 to 20. We are the fable, we are a tree was used to give a message. So I just said that for the persons who feel, she come in here with a Easter fable, I'm giving you it to give a message. So I want you to listen to this story carefully. Those who never heard it with the tongue mouse and the country mouse, remember? Tongue mouse went to look for country mouse, remember? And when tongue mouse went to look for country mouse, what country mouse gave him to eat? Anybody remember the story in primary school? He went there. He gave him wheat stalk, roots, acorn, a little dash of cold water for the drink. You come from town where even if KFC price go up, you still want your spicy and your zinger. You don't care you're lining up for fast food every day. Your only concern during the lockdown was that you can't get doubles. Yes? But you go on country and they're giving you breadfruit, a little piece of banana, so country mouse going to town. I mean, town mouse going to country and getting a little stalk, a little root, a little acorn, and no juice, cold water to drink. So the town mouse ate very sparingly. He nibbled a little bit of this. You know, children, you know when parents cook food, you ain't like? Gosh, I said a patch of and lettuce and broccoli. So you nibble a little piece of here, yeah, really that you want macaroni pie and fried chicken? Yes. <sighs> You're giving me broccoli. Give the cow grass. I don't want grass. I want pie. Yeah? So tongue mouse eats sparingly. He nibble a little bit. He nibble a little that. He made it very clear that he was eating the food to be polite. You know, when you are well grown, your parents tell you, when persons, you go into people's home or you're eating out and they offer you food, don't skin up your face and say that. Eat it. Be polite. It was prepared. So tongue mouth, eat a little, he nibble a little bit just to be polite. And after that, they had a talk. Well, tongue mouth start to talk about the life and tongue, you know. He talk about all what he does eat there and all what he does there and all the big meals he have there and all the city life and all the luxuries and country mouse listening. And when tongue mouse don't talk about the lights and the food and all the excitement, 
country mouse start to think, hmm, I need to get a little taste of that, not so? You know when you see the lights of Hollywood and the lights and everybody outside of your little closeted religion seem to be having fun except you? So country mouse decide he had to go to town. You know when people say country mouse come to town? Well, country mouse pack up and country mouse going down to town. Of course, before they went to town, they went to sleep in a quiet comfort in a little, you know, a little hedgerow, you know, in a little bush there because they're in the country. And they slept in quiet and comfort peacefully until morning. And in her sleep, the country mouse dreamed she was a town mouse with all the luxuries and all the delights of city life that the friend described. So the next day, when Tongue Mouse asked Country Mouse to go to City City, she said, yes, I'm coming. Well, when they reached the mansion where Tongue Mouse lived, they saw on that, now remember, it's two mice, huh? it's mice, right? When they reached where the mouse lived, they found on the table in the dining room a very fine banquet. In the first instance, where Tongue Mouse carry country mouse where they sleep and it's down some dark cellar and a whole set of other mouse down there too in a dark through a dark hole you know Tom and Jerry down in a little cellar down there and then they say you ready to eat you want to see what a... so they went up there if you see the dining room table fine banquet sweet meat jelly pastry cheeses some of the most tempting food a mouse could imagine but just as Country Mouse was about to nibble a little piece of pastry, she hear meow and a big scratch on the door. And Tom Mouse say, run! And they run through the hole. And when they went to the hiding place and wait for a long time, guess what happened? Everything eat out. The guests lick up everything. And the cat is there. So country mouse just watching, but they can't touch nothing. They go on back now into the feast where they hope they could at least get some scraps around. When they go on back home, the door open and the servants come now to clear the table with a big dog in tow. So country mouse ain't get nothing to eat. Country mouse now went back down in the tongue mouse, tongue mouse downstairs. And all country mouse stay long enough to do was what? Pick up suitcase and head back to the country. You know why? Because country mouse recognize that all the luxuries and all the dainties couldn't be compared to the nice plain food that you could at least eat and be comfort. In most instances, we are here. Tampuna is like a little country, not so? You're more like on the... In most instances, a lot of people, well, country, my dad and they grew up in Matlock, so you know that real country. Yes, so that country boy came to town, and he came to town there, and that's where he came to get an opportunity. So we know the differences between town and country, between cities and country. Some people like the country mouse, they hate the city, they hate the fast life, they hate the excitement, they hate the danger, they hate the noise. And these people who hate these things, they go as far as saying God hates that city too. And, and we had managed to get out of the cities and live in the country. So if that is the case, we should leave all them cities to burn, not so? Not so, because God hates cities, not so? City is corruption and fast life and things, so everybody must move to the country, not so? So God loves the city, yeah? So it means some people need to be there to share the, not so? Because God loves the city as well. Now you have to know your purpose and we are going to send on you. That's why the Bible say, if every piece of luxury you see you want, you can't be in the world and not of the world. You know some people, you know how Dracula like blood? 
You put Dracula to guard the blood bank, what he'll do? Drink the, he drinking everything, right? So some people, city not for you. Because as you hear a little beat, you in carnival mode. As you smell a little drink, you drunk. As you hear a little music, you forget the hymns and the hymnal. And as you see a little fashion, it have nothing like modesty. You need to stay away from the city. You need to go in the bush like Moses and find God. Because when you go to the city, you gone. Right? So some people need to stay in Trinidad and not go America. Because when they get luxury and things so, when they see all them things they see and they could see in real, they will be by people and thing. You know, they will be going around the city and enjoying the nightlife. And then they would say, God, what God? So you have to know your weakness. So the city, not for everybody. But God still loves the city. And some people have to go into the city. So the question is, we have any city in Trinidad based on definition of city? We have any cities in Trinidad? What are the traits of a city? A highly populated and highly organized place that serves as the epicenter of everything. Money, culture, politics, and more. They are filled with skyscrapers, roads, subways, and tons of services. Additionally, in cities, there are people from all places and culture. And there are places where many exciting things happen. Innovation, education, and work. If we were to resurrect, let's say God came here now, just, just um, doing a hypothesis hypothesizing here. Let's say God were to come here and he say, he going to raise up some of our grandparents or persons we have lost in the 70s and 60s. And you tell them, go into Port of Spain or go into Arima. Would they recognize it? Would they recognize it? Because some people who have been to Port of Spain in a while, in my days of going into Port of Spain regular, it had Salvatore building. I didn't go far while after Salvatore building breakdown. When I went down here, something missing here. If persons haven't gone into Port, gone into Port of Spain in a while, a lot of skyscrapers, not so? Because we want to achieve developed status, and part of that is what I described here in terms of your city being your industrial center, and so on. So we are still getting there. That's the city life you call that, St. James. The city that never sleeps. And I'm sure there are places in Arima that doesn't close anymore. Remember the days they used to close. So when you are looking at city, it is very hard to define. That's why I gave you traits. But there is one definition I found in terms of a relatively large, dense, and heterogeneous human settlements featuring complex social structure and institutions resulting in cultural production extending beyond its boundary. I say, we ain't had no city here. <laughs> but as I said, we are contextualizing because based on our experience, there is a stark difference in Trinidad between country life and city life. Am I correct? So we do have country and we do have city. It just may not be like the global cities. What do I mean by that? What are some of the largest cities in the world? Tokyo, right? Tokyo in Japan is one of the most popular cities on the planet. It is famous for being highly techno technological and having a super cool modern culture. What's the population of Trinidad? 1.4 to 5 million. What's the population of Tokyo? 37.1 million. And that's just the city. That's not the country, that's the city. New York in the US is like the center of everything with a lot of money, trade, and pop culture. What is the population of New York, which is a city in America? 8.4 million, right? What's the population of the whole of Trinidad again? One point, right. So you're getting the idea. London, the capital of England, a historic city that plays a major role in the world economy and politics. What's the population of London? In 2023, 21.76 million. What's the population of Trinidad again? 
So the whole of Trinidad could lose in London a few times, right? Beijing, China's capital, important place for politics and culture. What's the population there? 21.7 million people. This one takes some pronunciation. In this part of the globe, we say Sao Paulo, but if you want to sound like them in Brazil, you say Supolio or something like that, right? <laughs> Brazil is where everything happens in South America. It has a lot of trade, fun, and culture. What is the population of the capital, Sao Paulo, in Brazil? 22.8 million. What's the population of Trinidad, Trinidad, the whole of Trinidad again? Now, these are just cities and countries. So when you see they say, does God love your city? It means as small as we are here in Trinidad, in this global world church, there, is a, there are large cities to be reached with the gospel. Let's look at Mumbai, India, a growing city and super important for business. What's the population there? 21.2 million. And let's go to Nigeria, the major African financial center that has been described as the cultural financial entertainment capital of Africa. What's the population of Lagos, a city in Nigeria? 16.5 million. So when we look at God love, does God love your city? It has to be understood in our local context in terms of Port of Spain and the nice life because someone from the country here who is sheltered who go into Port of Spain, that's a big thing for them. And likewise, a Trini who go abroad and see all them big cities and train, it's like the eye open, they come back yanking, they come back quarreling about the customer service and the terrible roads and this underdeveloped country. When I went through Heathrow and when I went through Chicago, you came out in the airport and you lost the people. You have to listen on the plane for your departure gate. That airport, big like Port of Spain. You go to that university, it big like a whole city. They are, they are overpass. You have to take taxi to get one end of the campus to the other. And you come back, oh, small little Trinidad, you know. <laughs> I can't live here anymore. I, like Country Mouse, got a taste of the town life. Country Mouse didn't like it, and Pac, man, I loved it. You should have seen across there. So there are a lot of people like the city, but when you get to the city, you have to impact the city, because wherever God sends you, it's not for you to align yourself, but for you to make an impact. That's why the theme is, does God love the city? And persons living in cities normally have a lot of emotional issues. Country mouse get it one time and pack up and go. Country mouse get culture shock. I cannot lie down and sleep in my little hedge. I can't eat my little acorn and stuff. I had to be looking out for Rottweiler and cat and, and had to be hiding in a hole in a cellar only smelling smoke, but in the country it's lovely breezes. Yeah? When you when you go to places like in the East Trinidad, when you pass Valencia and you start to hit Belandra and San Susi, how does the air feel? Man, you send down the AC. When you're in the tongue with your AC, you have the AC up and you have the thing on to, to kill all the smell from outside. Because it just but when you hit Belandra and you start to drive along that sea, you send down your glass, you got the air coming in, the sound of the ocean, the taste of salt on your lips when you lick your lips. You know, everything is just, but then the people from town going in the country and spoiling it and putting up a set of buildings to block the sea. So when you're driving in the east, you're seeing buildings, you're no longer seeing the sea. Does God still love that city? So living in the city isn't always that is it's poor trade. They can feel stressed because everything moving fast. The traffic is a mess. Look at the traffic going into Port of Spain on a morning. And despite being surrounded by a lot of people, people in the city could be very lonely because they lack deep connection with others. In the country, what's separating houses are hedges. 
and flowers. Anybody remember that? You talk to your neighbor across your head, your neighbor dog in your yard, you pick the neighbor mango, the neighbor plum tree hanging over yours. You're talking to the neighbor from through your kitchen when the morning neighbor, you know, the, you're taking a shortcut through the neighbor yard to go home. But when you come down to town, there are walls that separate us. Am I correct? Because it had plenty of bandits, so you had to build a wall and you had to put a fence. Sometimes you ain't see a neighbor for a whole month. How many of you see your neighbors every day? Enjoy that country life. Go down town and live. There's walls separating. Go in those gated communities. Go in those other places. Some neighbors don't know what one another look like. You see house building, the house go up, people moving, and you say, who live in here? You know, I never see them. Anybody know about that? Yeah, because that's the town life. So there are a lot of people, but they are still very lonely. And anxiety and the pressure to succeed because you have to keep up with the Joneses. That's why God loves the city and we need to be going there. Depression can be more common in cities because life is more intense. But God loves the city. And God wants us as his hands to show that love to the city. One how would we know God loves the city from the Bible? Jonah, remember the first mention of the word city in the Bible. Remember Cain had Enoch and they built a city. Go back to Genesis 4, 17. He built a city and called the name after his son Enoch. So Enoch, of course, family had some serious issues. They created cities where all kind of stuff handled, happened. So they left the east of the Garden of Eden and went and did what? Build cities. After God sent the flood, what did they try to do again? Build a city tower, Babel. That was the building of a city, you know, so they could prevent God from scattering them. And then you have, let me show you how Jonah came. Cush begat Nimrod, Genesis 10, 6 to 12. Cush begat Nimrod. He was a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Whereof it was said, even as Nimrod the hunter before Lord and the beginning of the kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. And out of that land went forth Ashu and built Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kela. And between Nineveh and Kela, the same is a great city. So in Genesis 11, 4, they say, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reached to the heaven so we may make a name for ourselves. If we don't do that, we will get scattered all over the earth. And the Lord scattered them anyway. Then we come to Jonah. So God sent a messenger to the city because God realized they're losing it. They ain't get it. Here it is, I sent a flood because of the same city life. Because I remember when, when God told Lot to go in the mountain, what did Lot say? Send me to that city, Dana. Remember? Those of you who follow that story, Let's say, the angel took him and the angel said, go up in the mountain. Let's say, I could go in that city there. That city looking like, because we like the city life. Those of you who know the story, when Lot went in the city, how long he stay? <laughs> what he tell the Lord? Send me back in the mountain now. Because when he went in the city, he couldn't take it. City life. Since then, there is a thirst for the bright lights of the city, the life of the city, the fashion of the city, the music of the city. The table. But God say, I love the city and I sending you into the city not to be like them, but to make a difference. So when you go to Rima this evening, you can't be ashamed to tell somebody, look at truck and they ain't want to take it. Hold it out still. Because you know city people don't like embarrassment, me. <laughs> Give a truck and the people at you, look, they're coming. Good evening. Oh. And you see the curtain pull, so you know they push that curtain back and they say, wait until they go. And you shame. All of that is part of it. God was despised too. God say, I ain't sending you there to become stush and pompous like them. I sending you there to make an impact because God loves the city. When he tell Jonah, remember when he told Jonah to go? Now, Nineveh was an extremely violent place filled with wickedness. Nahum 3.1. It was so bad that there was an ancient scroll that says the kings of Nineveh would grab their enemies and literally burn them after stripping off their skin. They were insanely wicked. 
So when you see Jonah take a ship going somewhere else, Jonah know about them wicked people and some of Jonah family pass out by them. So apart from knowing how wicked they see what them convert, as far as he concerned, fire burn for them, as they say in Jamaica. But despite all their violence and wickedness, God didn't want to give up on them without giving a chance to change. Amen? Amen. Regardless of what we do, God always gives us a chance to change. But it's our choice. I could preach the light blue in your face and you decide to do what you want. It's your choice. I did my job. So God sent Jonah to warn them. That when Jonah, eventually when he got, well, you know the story, he went elsewhere. When Jonah warned them, what did they do? What did they do? Did they have to have a crusade for eight weeks and make altar call after altar call after altar call for them to repent? Jonah walked through, probably Jonah was little. You know, Jonah was like, okay, Lord, you're my So Jonah probably walked through because, remember, Jonah wanted them to burn. So Jonah probably went through, man of Nineveh, repent because the Lord is going to, he probably just passed through and repent because the Lord is, repent because, and when he said to all of them, he went and sat down to wait for them to burn. <laughs> Jonah find a cool spot there. And Jonah say, let the fire begin. When Jonah ain't see no fire, ain't he start above God? You make, what he tell God? You make me look like a fool. I went and preached to them. And you come and you save them. So what I preach for? I preach for them to burn. Now I looking like the fool. I sitting down here waiting and you save them. You put me all through all that embarrassment and all that stress to save them. And what did God tell Jonah? But I'll give you a chance to. I didn't bump to save you after you disobey. So the same salvation God has given us, he wants us to go and give to people wherever they are. Because all are valuable in the sight of God. Yeah? And then our city might be full of good things, but God wants you to help those in the city. Our city have issues. Look at the crime problem. Look at the problem of child abuse. Look at the, the 11 year old I was raped. My belly still hurting me every time I think about that. Gang raped by four big men. Our city is in a mess. So yes, we only have one point something million, but it's just as bad as these big cities. Am I correct? Not all, you know. But the bad ones are bad like years, as we say. They so because they are watching it, they are imbibing the culture on all the social media and the electronic media and the television media and whatever media they are imbibing it. So our small city reflects the same problems of the large city. Am I correct? Does God love our city still? And the message is sent to us. So one, God sends messenger. And two, God shows compassion. Remember Jesus, our scriptural reference? Jesus went through all the towns and villages doing what? Our scriptural reference for this morning, Matthew 9, 36 says, when Jesus saw the crowds, what happened? He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You ever watch some people thinking they enjoying themselves and you feel sorry for them? Because, you know, when they wake up in the morning, they will regret it. You know, at some point in their life, they would look back and wish they didn't do it. You know, they're probably crawling into their doors, all the happy face, life nice, throw back and fling the hand in the air and have a good carnival. And when they go in the house and close the door, they are depressed. They cannot sleep. They are waiting for morning to come. So as much as the body looking happy, the eyes are hollow. Because the eyes are the seat of the soul. And you could look in some eyes and see that some person is just searching for something more. Even though they're given the impression that. I could search into a number of your eyes and you're here today, but all kind of thing going on in your homes, in your environment, in your workplaces, in the city. God saw that and had compassion in them. And the same way God has compassion on you, where he says, regardless of what you're doing, come into my courts. It's the same way he's telling you, go into the city and have compassion on these people. 
share with them the joy you have. Now, if you don't have the joy, you have nothing to share. But share with them the joy you have. So God had compassion. So understand that, one, God sends messengers to the city, and two, God shows compassion. According to the Matthew, again, he went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Compassion means putting yourself in another person's shoes. I tell people it's not all about you. And sometimes when you think you have it so bad, there are others who have it worse. But we are all through our situations so we can encourage others in the similar situation. If God takes you to it and he brings you through it, you are empowered to tell someone else you can also come through it because he brought me to it and he took me through it. And you are able to put yourself in their shoes. So yes, God cares about people in the city. Yes, it is full of chaos. It looks confusing. People are lonely, stressed, sick, dealing with issues. But Jesus went through teaching and healing. His heart was moved and he expects us to reflect him. So remember, God also empathizes, and that's love in action. And finally, God transforms cities. Who was the ultimate city boy but Saul? Remember Saul? In fact, for those of you Bible scholars who know the 2300 day of prophecy that ended in AD 34 and started in 457 BC, and in the middle of the week, the Messiah was cut off, but they were still given another three and a half years there. But they didn't accept it, and they showed that they didn't accept it with what act? What singular act was the gospel taken from the Jews and given to the Gentiles? The stoning of Stephen. Who gave the command to stone Stephen? It's all. <laughs> that same Paul in the Bible. Saul gave the command to stone Stephen. And the Bible tells us when Stephen was being stoned, it's a cruel death. He looked in the heavens and what happened? Well, you must read them things. You know, it's those things that help you keep strong. He saw the heavens open. When you could see Jesus in your trial, you think people have any power over you? So Stephen is being stoned. If you see heaven open and Jesus looking at you face to face while you are being decimated, how will you look? Will you know what is taking place around you? And that is why we are told to hold on to God tight in the midst of our trials. Because while Stephen was being stoned, I am sure there was a glow on Stephen's face that Saul could not understand. Because he is a man on the ground, tied, being stoned, but they didn't see what Stephen saw. Stephen saw Jesus probably seen. So Stephen probably had a smile with his last breath because he saw Jesus. So Saul is leaving now, and he's on, is it the Damascus Road? And a bright light, probably the same light Stephen saw. So that light was to tell Stephen, well done. They go kill your body, but they can't kill your soul. Because his breath goeth forth. He, not at your soul wandering around, you know. His breath goeth forth. He returned to the earth in that very day his thought perish. And we look at the fact that the soul goes back to God and the body goes back to the dust. So that's why they say, you rest in Jesus. In other words, the Lord has your, the breath of the dead righteous until they are resurrected on resurrection morning and he give it back to them. Yeah? So that's why they say when you die, make sure your soul is hid in Christ with God, meaning that breath. Let God be preserving it to give it back to you on the first resurrection. So Stephen is going on the Damascus Road now, and probably he didn't see the same way Paul said. He saw a light, and that light made Stephen smile. But what did that light do to Saul? It made him blind. Sometimes God has to blind us first to see our true condition. So in being blinded, he saw his true condition. And what did God say to, to Saul? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting Stephen? No, no. He said, why are you persecuting me? So when people are persecuting you as Christians, they know it's God they're persecuting. 
because you are God's child. So when they hurt you, they hurt God. But God still have you. And when he told Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? All these sermons Saul would have heard and never walk up to the altar call. One time he get it because at the same time he tell him, go to Annas. It was Annas. Because God already had somebody in the future for him to go to. So sometimes you go into your situation, God don't organize that in the future, you know, for somebody to tell you the right thing or give you the right encouragement, you know, because that's how God works. And immediately, Saul became Paul. Why? Because the gospel, God showed up in that city. And that gospel changed life. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of salvation. Did Saul get the gospel? Yes. The gospel was turned to me and be saved because the gospel is about telling people, turn from your wicked ways and follow Christ. Stop going in that direction, go in this direction. So Saul got the gospel. There was a change in the city. So this teaches us that God doesn't just transform individuals, but he transforms entire cities. How do we know this? Go through the cities in Revelation. Go through all of them. Who was major in transforming them? Paul, the persecutor of Christians, became a guy who planted churches everywhere. Ephesians, Galatians, Corinthians, Ephesus, all those places he went through. This is the man who gave the command to kill Stephen. Could you imagine when Paul and Stephen meet up in heaven? <laughs> But the thing is, we would be seeing with new eyes, eh? And if we don't practice those eyes here, we wouldn't be able to practice them there. So God has power to transform not only individuals, but entire cities.